This session is going to be all about stories, and I want to start with a story about myself and how this project came about. So uh, I think it was 2011, I was standing in London Bridge uh, next to, I don't know if people know Richard Martin, but I was standing next to Richard Martin, you do, who had a pair of binoculars and was looking up at the shard at six women who were climbing the shard and attempting to hang a banner from the top. You may know this story. And Richard said to me, you know what, we should have like a, a tour or trail of all the different places that Greenpeace has done actions. And I thought, that's a really good idea, but I think it can be more interesting than that. <laughs> and that is where the idea for doing something specifically about women and the role that they have played in changing our uh, communities and our society through their activism. And uh, I pitched an idea to the Heritage Lottery Fund to build a walking tour app. And I chose East London for the focus of this because partly I'm from East London and a very proud East Londoner. Um, I, I should say it's my adopted home. I wasn't brought up there. Um, although I do, my family did originate from there. Um, but it has been such a hotbed of activism and much of it has been done by women. Um, yet these stories go really unreported. Um, so I'm gonna, at the moment we're kind of halfway through the project. It's due for completion in July, which is when we'll be launching the app. Um, and this is, but I wanted to come today because through the um, research we've been doing in the archives and we're collecting oral histories, we're just uncovering so many amazing stories and there's so many themes that are coming out that I think are so relevant for campaigners today. And through my outreach work, my original plans, I was going to go and talk to communities in East London and we've had all sorts of different craftivism events and a, a picnic with Bengali women and I thought I need to be talking to campaigners because this is so relevant so I contacted Wayne and he very kindly let me come here today. Um, so that's a little bit of background. Uh, I want to start off by talking about what is an activist. Can you, first of all, can you put your hands up? Who would describe themselves as an activist? Oh, most, most people. Does anyone have a kind of negative connotation of the word activist? Would you say, yeah, I'm a campaigner, but I'm not an activist? Yeah. Yeah, and this is something I keep hearing through. I actually did um, a focus group with young people because part of this project is to engage young, young women in activism as well. And I said, do you have a problem with the word feminist? And generally they were like, no, feminism's cool nowadays. And I said, what about activism? And they were, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> so what, what do we mean when we say activist and why have I used that word? Um, look at these six pictures. Do you think any of these are, are, are not activists? This one, oh, the police, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> but the woman in the middle. Does there, everyone, does everyone think they're activists? It could be. I struggle to call the baby an activist because it might not be moving. No, <laughs> but, but what's happening in that scene? Yeah. Why do you think they're all activists then? I think there's a tendency to like over glorify the like simple acts of like where activism hits the media. Uh, and undervalue um, all of the stuff that's going on, which is probably even more activism, like childcare or making food or, you know, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, pitching tents or whatever you're doing. Mm. So um, I, I'll tell you what they all are. The, this, this first one here um, is actually uh, taken in Washington on a protest to demand justice for black men who've died at the hands of white police as part of the Black Lives Matters movement. Um, the one in the middle here, this is a lady called Lutfan Hussein. She absolutely does not define herself as an activist, but I think she is. She founded the Coriander Club in 2000, which is a gardening and cookery club for Bengali women. Um, and she provides women with a regular opportunity to socialise with others, learn how to grow vegetables as well as cook them. Some of the women are first generation migrants and only speak Bengali um, and they uh, often didn't have opportunity to 
uh, leave the house um, or was scared to do so. So I, I definitely see what she where's, does. Where's that? And who is uh, the, uh, her name is Lutfan Hussein, and uh, that project's based at Spitalfield City Farm. Um, the third one, at the, the the one on the far right. Um, it's probably my favourite one. This is a, a woman sits in front of riot police blocking the road to protect protesters during the anti-government protest in Seoul, South Korea. Um, it was part of a trade union general strike and protest against South Korean government policies, um, including reformation of the labour market and public pension system. Uh, this is an interesting one. This was uh, a Polish woman takes part in breastfeeding is not obscene protest in Warsaw subway in rejection to a ban imposed by city officials on an art project portraying breastfeeding mothers. The project was supposed to have been displayed in the subway. Um, and then, then this one uh, is actually part of the One Billion Rising. So even something like dancing can be a form of activism in the right context. So those who don't know, One Billion Rising is an international movement that denounces violence and injustices against women. And I, I, I added the last one in the corner um, because that is um, migrants protest against, uh, behind a fence against restrictions limiting passage to the Greek Macedonian border. Uh, Macedonia's restricted passage to northern Europe to northern Europe to only Syrians, Iraqis, and Afghans who are considered war refugees. All other nationalities are deemed economic migrants and turned to hold back. And I just thought it was interesting because she's praying, and I think some people might not consider prayer a form of activism, but I think actually people do come together through religion. And actually, I had an event on Monday where with a group of Bengali women where we talked about that, and it's, not, it's something that I actually haven't looked at in this project, but it's an interesting area. So. This is the definition of activi activist. It comes from the word actus, which means uh, doing, driving force, or impulse. Um, and this is a definition I got from, I, th I think, the... I can't remember which dictionary, one of them, Cambridge or Oxford. Uh, someone who takes part in activities that are intended to achieve political or social change, especially someone who is a member of an organisation. So. I'm sticking with the word activist in the ads, so in connotations, because I think actually all these people are activists um, and they just engage in different forms. So, why all the fuss about women? Can anyone tell me who this person is? See who has been paying attention in their history class at school? Anyone? No? Uh, if I told you it's William Wilberforce, can anyone tell me who William Wilberforce is? Slavery. Slavery. What did he do? He was instrumental in getting the legislation in place to stop the slave trade, wasn't it, rather than slavery, I think? Uh, Somewhere. Yeah, well, I will read you the what it says on Wikipedia. William Wilberforce was born in 19, uh, 1759 and died in 1833. He was an English politician, philanthropist, and leader of the movement to abolish the slave trade. The campaign led to the Slavery Abolition Act 1833, which abolished slavery in most of the British Empire. Is that what everyone understands as William Wilberforce? Yeah? OK, I want to tell you some really important things about William Wilberforce. There were also 30,000 people who joined a boycott of sugar grown uh, in slave run plantations. And because women were the main purchasers of household goods, those, that 30,000 was mainly made up of women. Um, but Wilberforce opposed this boycott. He thought the solution could be done in Parliament and that was it. He also thought women campaigning was unladylike. Um, but despite this, these women went ahead anyway. And they were hugely successful in winning around um, public support. They went around, as well as these boycotts, which had a huge impact, um, they also uh, just went door to door, they organised lecture tours, and this is amazing stat, I think. In Birmingham, the women visited 80% of homes, um, just talking to people. And I think we know nowadays that actually having community support for your cause is absolutely vital. And if Wilberforce had just gone on his purely um, parliamentary route, it probably wouldn't have gone through. 
And on also an interesting sort of side note, which isn't related to women, but I think is interesting as well, the story of the abolition of slavery also admits the contribution by black abolitionists and also the Caribbean slave revolts, who obviously were taking huge, much greater risks than Wilberforce. So I'm not, I'm not denying that Wilberforce did a lot of really good stuff, but it's only part of the story. And we build statues to him and none of these other people that did really incredible work, and they have just been omitted from our history. Anyone tell me who this is? Which one? Emily. Yeah, okay, what can you tell me about Emmeline Pankhurst? She and her daughters, mm -hmm. daughters in the world, um, led the suffragettes, or were at least the most famous suffragettes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, she had three daughters, Sylvia, Christabel and the other one. <laughs> I can't remember. Um, I don't think Adele. She's, Adele. Yeah, she's not really talked about that one. Though. Yeah. Um, so this is what it says in Wikipedia about Emmeline Pankhurst. She was a British political activist and leader of the British suffragette movement who helped women win the right to vote. In 1999, Time named Pankhurst as one of the hundred most important people of the 20th century, stating. She shaped an idea of women for our time. She shook society into a new platform pattern from which there could be no going back. Um, she's widely criticised for her militant tactics and historians disagree about their effectiveness, but her work is recognised as a crucial element in achieving the suffrage in Britain. Okay, I'm going to tell you some facts about Emmeline Pankhurst that you may not know. She actually only wanted the vote for women on equal terms as men, which would have excluded 40% of mostly working class women. So she actually, she wanted women to have power, but only privileged women. So the power was remaining with the privileged. Um, it was actually the East London Federation of Suffragettes, led by her daughter Sylvia, who campaigned for universal suffrage for both men and women. Um, and Sylvia, as I said, yeah, she had, so Christabel and uh, Emmeline stuck together um, and Adele got shipped off to Australia, she fell, so Sylvia and Adele opposed their mother and Adele ended up getting shipped off to um, Australia and Sylvia uh, broke contact with her eventually. This was the first kind of part, uh, stage of their parting uh, because Sylvia wanted to campaign for universal mm. suffrage um, and has Who's seen the suffragette movie? Okay, so you know there's a there's a really important part in there about um, that that really wound me up, and it's about all this kind of way we revise history. Um, for those who don't know, and there's no spoilers here, the main story is a working class woman who joins the suffragette movement, and there's a scene in her home where she's talking with her working class husband, and he doesn't want her to continue to campaign, and he says to her what will you do with the vote when you get it? And she says, the same thing as you. Now that really admits a really important point was that working class men also did not have the vote. Um, and this um, issue about the working classes just being excluded just doesn't get talked about. Um, so I wanted to share this quote for, with you. This is actually from a Russian journal uh, written in 1913, but the reason I like it is I think it's still very relevant today. So for bourgeois women, political rights are simply a means uh, allowing them to make their way more conveniently and more securely in a world founded on the exploitation of working people. For women workers, political rights are a step along the rocky and difficult path that leads to the desired kingdom of labour. Um, so what's really interesting about... Um, East London is we have such a uh, concentration of working classes and working class women and they have just been a hotbed of activism and uh, they've been driven to this uh, through their uh, situations but our history tends to focus on the white middle class women so we really wanted to look at who else was there. So I'm going to take you through a few stories now. So these are the Match Girls. You may have heard these ones are actually reasonably well known. Do people know about them? You mentioned the Match Girls before. Can you tell anyone oh, about no, it? I don't know enough yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the Match Girls um, worked in the Bryant May factory in um, uh, Bow. 
And they worked in really terrible conditions, 14 hours a day. They worked with white phosphorus, um, which literally melted your jaw. You may have heard of fossy jaw, which is the um, effect that the chemical had on their faces just literally melted away. Um, and there was an article about the conditions by, uh, in a, magazine, a radical journal called The Link, which was written by a, a socialist called Annie Besant. And after finding out about this, the uh, factory owners sacked one of the informants. Uh, and uh, by the end of the day, 14, 000, uh, sorry, 1,400 women had gone on strike. Um, now, what's very interesting about these women, as you can see, these are not rich women. They were very young a lot of them. Uh, they were working class um, and they were mostly migrants. And I think they were mostly Irish. I think there were a few um, Jews as, in there as well. So the strike went on for three weeks um, and it was hugely successful. Um, and one of the things that they were really good at was gathering the community support in the way that we'd seen um, the uh, the anti-slave trade women do in Wilbur, William Wilberforce's time, they went round and gathered the support of the community and they had very strong networks because of their migrant communities. Um, and as a result, this, this was a quote, they, they organised a protest up to um, Parliament and this was an observer who said, few people could fail to be touched by the way in which the, the girls were determined to stand together at all costs. In every direction, girls might be seen plotting how they could help one another on until Brian and May gave them their pennies. Um, so yeah, they were very successful and really shocked the middle classes who thought that working class women, well, they were often depicted as inadequate victims of their circumstance. Um, and actually, they were so successful that they really influenced the Dockers strike. Um, and uh, which was obviously led by the men and uh, was very successful in 1919. And if you read the historical accounts, um, you'd think that it was the men that came up with these ideas of gathering local community support, but actually the Dockers took those ideas from the match girls before them. So, next story. Sylvia Pankhurst, I've told you a little bit about her. Um, so we all know about the suffragettes. I, I, I don't really want to talk too much about the suffragettes, but what the suffragettes did afterwards. So Sylvia and her mother, first of all, as I mentioned, they, the schism occurred when um, they disagreed about who should have the vote, but they became further estranged when um, Emmeline Pankhurst gave, became a very fervent campaigner for the war, and she was one of the, the main person behind the White Feather campaign, which people might know about. They were given white feathers to men that they thought should be going fighting, not really knowing anything about these people at all. Meanwhile, um, Sylvia Pankhurst became a very active pacifist and she actually uh, supported the Women's Peace Congress in The Hague in uh, 1915. Um, she also practiced what became known as the personal is political. Um, so this was a term that was coined by the second wave feminists. So that's the women's lib movement of the 60s onwards. Um, and they, the, the second wave feminists said, oh, those first wave feminists, all they're worried about is the vote. But that's actually also a poor telling of history. So um, Sylvia very much embodied it because she um, refused to enter into a marriage contract with her father of the child. And, and that was actually what put the final nail in the coffin between her and Emmeline, that she refused, she lived in sin, basically. Um, and she recognised that um, it wasn't just about the vote, it was about systems that women functioned in. Um, and she also became very involved in uh, the campaign against fascism and colonial rule, as opposed to Emmeline, who was hurrah British Empire and was doing all she could to protect that. Um, and interestingly, um, Sylvia ended up in Ethiopia. She went there in 1956 and continued her campaign against fascism and colonial rule. And she died in Addis Ababa. And she actually received a state funeral and was named an honorary Ethiopian. And there was a really interesting article in The Guardian the other day. Um, and finally, we're going to get a statue to Sylvia Pankhurst. It's not going to be in Westminster, like Emmeline's is. It's going to be in Clerkenwell, and it's taken this long to get one of her. And there was a 
piece about it in The Guardian, and if you looked in the comments section below, there were all these Ethiopians going, oh, Sylvia, she's amazing! <laughs> it was just, it was, I was, I knew about this about her, but I didn't know how much she is still admired over there, and we've almost forgotten about her. This is Muriel Lester. Muriel Lester is, was born in Leytonstone, and she was dubbed the Mother of Peace. And she was twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, she campaigned during both wars and organised a number of activities, including prayers to enemy nations, services for pacifist speakers, cheap me meals for munition workers, and uh, protection to local Germans and Austrians. Um, in 1941, she was actually arrested on the orders of Churchill and detained in Holloway Prison for the remainder of the war because he didn't like this meddling woman who was going around talking about peace and that we should stop fighting. Um, she was also um, very active uh, during the Spanish Civil War um, and warned against the threat of the atomic bomb. And, you know, this woman has a whole lifetime of campaigning dedicated to peace activism, yet we barely know who she is and she's not included in any of our stories. Um, has anyone heard of the popular... Sorry, could you skip back to that slide? I wanted to finish off. <laughs> and... Uh, we did a little bit of craftivism related to this project and I made a little mini protest banner dedicated to Muriel Lester, um, which you can see downstairs in the archive rooms. We've made a few of them, but uh, I, I particularly liked her, so I, I dedicated mine there. Thank you. <laughs> um, have people heard of the Poplar Rate Revolt? It's a reasonably well-documented part of East End history. Um, but what's, so the story is, in um, the 1920s, this is in the very early days of the Labour Party, um, Poplar ele uh, elected a Labour council, and people completely amazed that this has happened, because this is like Labour were just coming out of the grassroots at this point. And it was led by a man called uh, George Lansbury. And they... Um, were required by the Poor Law of 1834 to fund their own local poor relief through the rate system. Um, but because Poplar had very high levels of unemployment combined with very low rents, which is where they got the money from, um, that meant that they had to charge very high rates to fund the enormous numbers of people who were unemployed, to the extent that they, the people in Poplar were paying twice as much um, in their rates than the people in the rich boroughs like Kensington. And then on top of that, they were expected to collect uh, what they, what's called a precept, which is rates for funding across London boroughs, uh, uh, London bodies such as police and water. And the Popular Labour Party said this is really unfair. Um, we're basically, we're not going to collect the precept. We're, our um, constituents are already paying... Um, way more than anyone else, uh, we're not going to charge them anything more. And they were told, basically, pay it or go to prison. Now, there were 30 rebel councillors, um, but what isn't told so much is that five of them were women, and those five women had been part of the East London Federation of Suffragettes. And they were not intimidated easily. So they stood by their working class principles, and they said, we're not going to pay it, we'll go to prison. Um, and they were sent to Holloway Prison and a crowd of 10,000 people came out um, in support of the women and they actually blocked the gates to the prison and said, you can't send the women in, this is barbaric. And Susan Lawrence, won it. so then I should tell you their names, it's very important. Uh, they were Minnie Lansbury, Susan Lawrence, Julia Skirr, Nellie Creswell and Jenny McKay. Um, and Susan Lawrence stood up and she said, we are here representing a principal which we have to defend as, uh, as well as the men. We go cheerfully determined to see this thing through. I hope our example will not be lost on local authorities throughout the country. Um, and uh, living in a, a, a borough which has a Labour council, I, I do sometimes wonder, hmm, it's been a bit lost on them. <laughs> 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 um, 
Yes, yeah, so, so they went to prison and the conditions were, were absolutely appalling. This is 1921. Um, Minnie Lansbury actually developed pneumonia following her imprisonment and died in 1922. And Julia Skur died five years later, age uh, 57. Her early demise, um, George Lansbury said, was attributed to her time in prison. I'm not sure, I don't think it was a, I think it might have been a year or 18 months or something like that, I'm not exactly sure, but it, you know, the conditions were so bad that, uh, you know, that was long enough. Has anyone heard of Arnold Wesker, playwright? Uh, yes. Yes, yes. So Arnold Wesker was a reasonably well-known uh, playwright, wrote a play called Chicken Soup and Barley Water. Roots? Is that what it's called? No, 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 there was another one called Roots. Oh, oh another one called Roots. Um, so, um, Chicken Soup and Barley Water is actually based on his aunt, Sarah Wesker. Um, so, Sarah Wesker was the founder of the United Clothing Workers Trade Union, um, and she led several strikes in several major textile factories in East London, mobilising hundreds of women. Um, she combined her communist politics with uh, Yiddishkeit, which means Jewishness, um, she was of Eastern European Jewish heritage and she brought that into the East End at a time where there was a very strong, um, this is sort of in around the, the 30s, a uh, very strong uh, Jewish community there. Um, but what's really interesting about Sarah, and, and actually she wasn't the only one, was that she was fighting two systems. She was fighting the employers, um, the uh, the bosses, basically, but she was also fighting a, a, a patriarchy within her own community. So this this quote um, just shows you what she was having to deal with with the workers. So we had this strike for a farthing on the price of a pair of trousers, and he never get, forgave me for that, even though he won, not us. I used to stand outside the factory and collect the girls' contributions. He would call me all the names under the sun and call the police, but the police would say she, she isn't doing anything wrong. So she was doing all that. She lost her job after organising these strikes. But also, this was a time, uh, we're in the middle of the Great Depression, and um, during the First World War, lots of women came into factories, but they were expected to move over when the men came back, and some did and some didn't. And at a time of mass employment, the trade unions, well, the... the the more open-minded members of the trade unions thought that uh, women's issues were peripheral to the issues of mass unemployment. Others were very hostile um, because um, they saw women as competition for the work that they wanted. So she was having to deal with two things um, in a way that a male activist was probably only fighting one. Um, and, and interestingly, the reason I've got this <laughs> picture here, this is actually from the cover of the play that Arnold Wesker wrote. Because I couldn't even find a picture of her. Um, there were loads of pictures of Arnold Wesker and none of her. Um, so, yeah, I found that quite annoying. <laughs> mm. So I'm going to jump forward in time a little bit. Um, this is Marla Sen. And Marla Sen came to London in the 60s, a time of growth for black activism. And she was really stunned by the level of prejudice in, uh, in Britain in general. And she, she started off up in Birmingham and she was advocating for labour rights up there, but eventually found herself um, in East London. And she came into East London um, in the 70s. And the 70s saw a time of a mass migration into East London. So we had women and children coming over from Bangladesh. They're, they're husbands and partners had come over before them and, and now they were coming in the second wave. And also many of the early migrants who'd gone up to the north were now moving back down to uh, East London because of uh, recession hit northern towns. And they congregated in the East End and, and particularly Tower Hamlets. Um, but the councils of the time were really unsympathetic unsympathetic and there was an institutional racism that said that these people had made themselves intentionally homeless and therefore didn't uh, have the right to be rehoused. So lots of people just didn't get any housing at all. 
Um, other people were housed but ended up in predominantly white estates and many of them chose to move into squats in Spitalfields, in living in pretty awful conditions, rather than uh, face the daily racist attacks and threats of violence towards them and their families. And so the housing situation was really dire. And um, Marla Sen, although she wasn't actually Bangladeshi herself, she teamed up with um, Darkus Howe and Terry Fitzpatrick and formed the Bengali Action Group, I think that was in 1974, and they sourced empty council flats for homeless Bangladeshis. They also drew up a map for, map for the Greater London Council, defining a safe living area for that community, and that's how Brick Lane got established as the Bangladeshi heartland of Britain. So she was really fundamental in that. This is Julie Begum, and I think she's actually one of my favourites as well. Um, she was, uh, so we're jumping forward to the 90s now. Um, so the 90s, some of you may remember, saw a real rise in uh, racist attacks, um, particularly on the Asian community. It was also um, when we saw Tower Hamlets uh, elect the first BMP councillor, Derek uh, Beckham. Um, and he, he won that by eight votes, I think it was. And this uh, resulted in a rise of activism, anti-racist activism. But there are a group of women, um, including but not exclusively Bengali, who um, thought that there should be a space for women within that. And they formed um, a non-hierarchical organisation called Women Unite Against Racism. And Julie was one of the key founders of that. Um, so they did two really interesting things. They first of all um, went door to door encouraging women to both register to vote and vote. And one of the issues uh, with that was a lot of Bengali women uh, were too scared to go to the polling booths because there would be BNP supporters hanging around the booths and they just thought that they, they, it was dangerous. So um, Julie and the others actually formed escorts to, take, to register the women and then actually take them to the polling booths. And um, the next, when the next elections came round, the BNP were actually voted out. So it, it wasn't all this group, but they were very, because lots of other things were going on as well. Um, but they were really instrumental in getting the BNP kicked out of um, the council. Um, this particular picture was taken in uh, 1994 um, in a protest, anti-racist protest um, in Bethnal Green. And Julie uh, explains here, the police had dogs and officers on horseback, and I remember the police wanted to set the dogs on the young men. So we women got in front to protect them, and the police had to stop because we were women. It was important to have a mix of people, men and women, and young and old, because police can behave very differently if it's just young men. There was a lot of solidarity, and it was nice. Um, so I think it was sh the reason why I like her so much is she recognised that there needed to be a space for women to devise their own campaigns and, and do what they were good at, but also that she worked together um, with the men and actually provided something very unique in order to support the men in their campaigning as well. Um, and I just think this multifaceted approach is really interesting. Another thing that's really interesting about it, does, has people heard of the Battle of Cable Street? Yeah, so this happened, if those who don't know, the Battle of Cable Street was when Oswald Mosey decided to march with uh, several thousand, I forget the numbers, um, British fascist union members through uh, Spitalfields, which was the Jewish heartland, and they were met with several thousand anti-fascist protesters um, who basically didn't let them pass. And this happened just a few uh, not even a mile down the road from that. So, and she saw the connection. She's actually an oral historian now. Um, and she saw the connection that actually she was part of that heritage that had once belonged to the Jews and now was belonging to the Bengalis. And, and that one of the things we've seen through our research is that there's this pattern that just emerges again and again with different groups and that women uh, in the Battle of Cable Street had a particular role that's often not talked about and, and in the same way that the Women United Against Racism did. So this is Zenith Raman. Uh, Zenith Raman is the founder of the Bromley by Bow Centre, which was started in the 90s and was dedicated to breaking isolation of Bengali women. 
She started by going from home to home, taking toys to build friendships with children and their mothers. Um, and this was so successful, she actually built a network of three to four hundred um, Bangladeshi people. Um, and she got them out of their homes and into the Bromley Barry Bow Centre where they um, met and worked and trained and set up community enterprises. And this is an example of what I've been calling gentle activism because it's quite different from, uh, you know, we've got the popular rebel councillors who went to prison and, uh, you know, you've got the suffragettes who, you know, well, doing different levels of, vi quite vi levels of violence, going to prison, being force fed. What she's doing is quite gentle, but actually is incredibly powerful. The fact that she connected three to 400 people, I think is amazing. Um, and what's also interesting about her when talking about repetitive cycles is that the East London Federation of Suffragettes, um, this is another thing the suffragette movie gets wrong. Not many women in the uh, in the East London actually took part in a lot of that violence activism because they simply couldn't afford to. Um, there's a story about um, Sophia Dulip Singh, who's one of the few um, uh, suffragettes of colour, and she threw, she was uh, a princess and she was the goddaughter of Queen Victoria, and she threw herself uh, in front of the uh, Lloyd George's car and she was arrested but when they found out she was Queen Victoria's goddaughter she was very quickly released. If you were a woman, working class woman in the east end of London you couldn't do that, you'd never see the uh, light of day again. So actually some of the things that East London Federation of Suffragettes did was very similar to what Zenith did like 80 years later, they set up Crashes. They and later opened a nursery in a disused pub called the Gunmakers Arms, and they renamed it the Mothers Arms, which I love. Um, and they set up um, a factory to provide um, work for working class women, and they made uh, clothing for um, sorry about the language, but the poor and needy. That's how it's described in the archives. Um, and so they did all these other things that helped. And at the same time, they're agitating for the vote and, and for um, living wage and things. So they were doing all sorts of other things to enable women to work their way out of poverty and break isolation and all these things. So that's another example of how we see this kind of repetition in different communities many years apart. Uh, this is Melanie, and she's one of the um, Heathrow 13. Uh, do people know about that, Plain Stupid? Yeah. Um, so Melanie lives in Wolfenstone, and she's a climate activist, and very recently took part in um, a peaceful, non-violent direct action against the expansion of Heathrow, uh, which saw 22 flights grounded, affecting people around the world. They were charged with aggravated trespass and were told to expect a custodial sentence. Um, and this would have made them the first British climate activist to have served jail time. But fortunately, they instead received a fine, uh, suspended sentence and community service. And the reason I include Melanie is that um, I saw in an interview with her, and one of her heroes is George Lansbury from the um, uh, popular rape rebel uh, popular rape revolt with the rebel Labour councillors, but I thought it was quite interesting that I mean obviously George Lansbury did lead them, but she also even though she knew that and she understands her history and her heritage, she also didn't talk about the women, and I think that actually goes to show how hidden these women are, um, even though they have made a significant contribution. So I want to sum this up in the things that we can, uh, we've gained from women activists in the past. They have been leaders in innovation, and I found this quote, um, if necessity is the mother of invention, and this David Rockefeller said, disconsent is the father of progress, and I was like, uh, no, I think it's the mother of progress, because actually something that these women ties all these women together is a level of discontent. Um, you know, struggling against racism, against the class system, against the patriarchy. And through that, they have been so inventive and creative, and I think they just, almost all of them, embody innovation. And I think bravery as well, and this is actually a picture from the Battle of Cable Street. Um, as I said, the Battle of Cable Street is quite well documented, um, but the part women played is less well documented. And actually a lot of the women were 
protesting from the tenement buildings and they were like throwing things down uh, from the tenement buildings and they, they said that actually most of the day they were fighting the police not the fascists and there's one wonderful story about how um, the, the women were throwing things down from the tenement buildings and the police ran into a shed and the women came down and not banging on the door and the police came out with their hands up and <laughs> so you know they were you know they were really strong brave women and, and almost because they were women I think almost makes them braver because it was you know it was mainly men and they were all fighting each other and some of these women like this lady here just threw herself into the middle of it and we see from the arrest figures I mean there were a lot more men arrested but there were women arrested as well and they you know they they didn't shy away um, so I think we've had that kind of bravery but also sort of a bravery of um, uh, someone like Sylvia Pankhurst who just stepped away from her mother and all of her family and did what she believed in and I think that just took enormous bravery as well and unique positioning, what, what we found time and time again is a lot of the activism um, that women have excelled at is because of their unique positioning and I think this is something that we should think about campaigning today is our women supporters, what can they bring to us that we're maybe not utilising. So this is a picture here um, of a, it's taken in the 1930s um, and it's a group of women who've organised a rent strike. Um, so in the 1930s there was huge problems with housing in the East End and uh, terrible conditions and unscrupulous landlords who were over illegally overcharging. And there were uh, some rent strikes, there were pickets, there were demonstrations, but there were also people who just stopped paying their rents. Um, and these were, there were several of them in the East End. And they were organised by women because the men were out at work all day and it was the women who had kind of charge of the home and, the, and they realised what these conditions were doing to their families and their children. Um, and they were hugely successful um, and they actually were so successful they spread throughout the rest of London and the rest of the country. Um, and also 70 years later we saw similar uh, housing protests which were by the Bengali women um, which were again organised by the women for exactly the same reasons. Um, so I think it's really important to think about, I mean obviously we have moved on from kind of women's position being in the home but I think still women do have a unique position um, within society and it's worth thinking about uh, what that can offer us with our campaigns and are we really utilising it or are we just doing the same things again and again that have been defined by uh, you know a, a, a not male gender but because that's what we've always done because that's what the men do um, and is there something else that we can do that suits women's needs uh, or women's um, Sensibility. sensibilities that's the word I'm looking for yeah